Hello everyone, I'm Grandmaster Danesh Borosh and this is how to prepare like a pro. This time we are going to look at Carlson's secret preparation. Now this is not the baby Carlson most people talk about. This is not the adult Carlson either. This is in between. So this Magnus Carlson actually worked with a legend. Does anybody know who I'm referring to when I say Magnus? And we're talking about 2009 slash 2010. He actually hired, semi was invited to work together. Now, this player slash legend who helped him is also have known to have played him in a rapid tournament in Reykjavik. Any guesses for this person? Legend to this day and actually a regular guest at the St. Louis Chess Club, mostly for ultimate moves. It is not Karpov, but Gary Kasparov. Yes. So Gary Kasparov famously offered to help Magnus Carlsen um, in his growth as a player. And this is one of those first um, efforts that feels that sort of came from this combo of Kasparov, Kasparov and Carlsen working together. So e4, e5, knight f3, knight c6. And a lot of times you might be wondering, especially if you're on the other side or the other end of the pond and you're pondering yourself, okay, so what is Kasparov famous for playing? He played plenty of matches against Karpov, but there's basically two big variations he plays. Now, even that doesn't always give away enough information. So I'm pretty sure Leiko sort of predicted some things that he's going to see in this game, but not everything. So you kind of expect the direction of the surprise and the preparation, but you might not know where it goes or comes from. So famously in the Karpov match, there was a semi sideline that uh, Kasparov inflicted on Karpov. Does anybody know which one that was. And we are, of course, not talking about Deru Lopez. Deru Lopez obviously has been a returning guest um, in that match in Lyon and many other ones later. It's, of course, one of the big debate they had, lots of Spanish games. But that wasn't really the surprise weapon that Kasparov used against Karpov. It was the scotch, exactly. So as time has passed by, and that match was around 1990s, um, <clears throat> Carlsen playing d4 isn't a surprise, because you could predict Kasparov is training with him. You may as well see the scotch. It's takes, takes. And here, Leiko played bishop c5. Not a bad choice by a large by Leiko, because knight f6 was played in that match, takes, pawn takes, e5, here, queen e2, knight d5, c4, bishop a6, and this was well known even back then, but b3 was a novelty by Kasparov, which was kind of unpleasant for Karpov to face, and uh, even though this game, which I'm going to just show some snippets, he did survive, it wasn't without some blood, sweat, and tears. So b3, this was the novelty by now. This is a well-known system and an established one. These days people play g6, but Karpov played long castle. g3, rook e8, bishop b2, f6, bishop g2, pawn takes, castles. So this is actually a funny position in some respect because black is up a single pawn. However, there is like a downside for black's position. So 
What do you think is the downside that black is sort of facing here? So if we get into our scotch debate. And it's mostly about observing the situation, trying to kind of guess what's misplaced for black or what could be a potential issue for Karpov. As this is from that Kasparov-Karpov game. Yes? Exactly. So the whole point of uh, Kasparov's system of going a to b3, c4, and just walling up that bishop is that bishop will get mummified there. It will never come back to life. Um, this is not an evanescence song. So in this case, the bishop is really bad. So Karpov decides to go for h5 and try to attack. Now. There is a fantastic documentary, a French documentary on this match where you could see both sides. You could see Kasparov and Karpov just rattle through the lines and tell their mindset and what they were thinking during the positions. So here, Kasparov gave his explanation that he played queen d2 and wasn't such a great move. That's what he said in that documentary, and he was saying, hey, rookie one would have been better. You're going to win the e5 pawn, go for the ending, and uh, you should be, let's see, knight f6 takes, takes, rook takes, and because of black's pieces being disharmonious, white is just better, and you have an extra pawn on the king side. But he played queen d2, and eventually the game ended in a draw after plenty of complications and fascinating play from both sides. Now, what's astounding though is that when I looked at the engine, was checking what was going on, the engine did say queen d2, what, what a nice move, and that was the move that Kasparov played and Kasparov said isn't the best. Now, of course, a lot of time has passed since, but it's interesting that uh, in a bigger depth, you may find rook e1 being stronger, but queen d2 on a lower depth is still considered to be pretty good. Maybe legends are still legends even today. There weren't really that many strong computers in the 90s. So uh, the fact that Kasparov sort of finds the right move, regardless of the fact that there weren't any computers around, that's still very, very commendable. But back to our game. Let's come back to our game here. Leiko, for that very reason, he knows Kasparov is on team calls and he goes for bishop c5. Bishop e3. Now, there's two lines. There's one line of knight takes c6. This is the older line. Queen f6. Queen d2 is the old, old, old one. Takes knight c3, bishop d4 etc etc this actually featured in another world championship match and that was between Xijun and Susan Polgar and Susan Polgar had a second helping her who actually turned out to be pretty good her name is Judith Polgar and um, Judith uh, kind of cooked up. They kind of worked together to play this Scotch variation against Xi Jun with an astounding effect because Xi Jun didn't know how to respond correctly and Susan actually crushed that opposition and Zhuja became a world champion. So bishop e3, this is another line. Queen f6, pawn to c3, knight e7, bishop c4. Classical way of playing. g3 was popular at some moment. I had some fun experience playing this line. The point being you're trying to put pressure on the d5 square. But bishop c4 is a bit more direct 
and it controls d5 immediately. Knight e5, bishop e2, queen to g6. Now, this so far is nothing new. This has been seen before, but it's a double attack. The question is, how should we respond? Now, don't forget, we're talking about calls in preparation. This has been seen. He knows what's happening. <clears throat> so, sometimes you can expect, and you could expect, some very, very brave play by the white player. Of course, because he has seen this position previously at home. Castles. The point is, you are going to have, if you go queen e4, knight b5 ideas, and you, as your king is still stuck in the middle, while my king is in safety, means I have a very, very sound attack going. So d6. Now, Leiko knew this. Um, Leiko, if you don't know, of course, was a world championship challenger, played a match against Kramnik, and wasn't far off from actually becoming a world champion. So if we're talking about someone who's very theoretical, it is Peter Leko. He knows the ins and outs of the E4, E5 systems, um, and he actually used it with great effect against Vladimir Kramnik in his match. So, so far, Leko is in book, and even though Castles is quite an astonishing move by in itself, it's not really the bombshell that Magnus is trying to show. Now, you want to be very, very aggressive in this position. If black manages to castle, consolidate, Leiko is going to be more or less solid, and when we see Leiko get a solid position, that means most of the time that he is out of danger. So our job here is to look for a play where white can go aggro. Yeah? Knight b5? So there's a little bit of a difference if we go here. If we go knight b5, they capture here. And previously, this pawn wasn't really defended, but here I can go king d8. Wait. I think I can do that as far as I can see. Yes. Takes your knight is going to get stuck far as I can tell. Although, it would be pretty logical. But, he went for this move f4. f4 and the idea is that, oh, I'm not going to give you time to consolidate. So if you just move back, I am just going to roll you down with f5, f4, f5, and you're just going to get squashed. Well, especially notice that this bishop on c8 is completely passive and can't move. So Leiko is taking up the gauntlet and takes on e4. Good move. Bishop f2, queen f4, and, well, queen f4 wasn't played. But the problem with queen f4 here, now knight b5 actually gains strength because if you take here, rook takes f2, I hit the queen and I threaten this at the same time. So bishop f2 takes, pawn takes, knight g6. Now, so far, Leiko has been playing the best way possible. But here comes Magnus's true novelty. And this move is kind of cold-blooded. So we found the aggressive one. 
Let's try to find the cold-blooded move as well. It always boils down to threats. One of those things I always talk about when I teach is threats. Always look out for what your opponent is trying to accomplish. Black is clearly trying to pick Carlson's king side into pieces. So he goes for this very cold-blooded move of pawn to g3. And pawn to g3 is quite something. Normally, you don't want to open up your king side, especially when there's already a queen there attacking the king. Now, if d5, there's bishop d3 and strong play against black's pieces. And uh, here, actually, Leiko had to emphasize this and go for bishop h3, bishop f3, queen f5, rook e1, d5, and this turns out to be okay for black. However, whenever you're preparing for an opponent, there is sort of a psychological evaluation going on. You're always trying to figure out what is the mindset they're having or what type of players they are. I already alluded to the fact that Peter Lake is a very solid player. He likes to get positions um, where he has no real issues whatsoever or no risk involved. Now, if you go bishop h3, there is still a chance you're going to run into prep by Carlsen. So it's a bit more dangerous to go bishop h3 here if you don't know what are you expecting. So Team Magnus actually correctly predicted that Peter Leko isn't going to go for something that's a bit shaky. He will go El Cemento, as he would put, as he would put it. He'd just castle and say, hey, my king is safe. I've got the extra pawn. How bad could this get? So we get this situation. Leiko manages to castle, and now it is for us to sort of prove the fact that we have compensation for the sacrificed pawn. Now, I'm going to give you a little bit of a heads up. Magnus does have the bishop there at his disposal, and that's actually super duper important. Why? Well, the bishop pair usually is enough compensation for a single pawn. However, it's enough but not quite more than that so our goal here is try to find magnus's strategy and in fact it's very logical what he does in this position Yes? Exactly. So that's exactly what uh, Magnus did. Knight to c3, queen f5, pawn to d5. And what is the point of going this way? Because I failed to ask that, but I'm going to redirect that question to you. Yes. And apart from the fact we've got the bishop there, now we've got that central pull. So we pushed Leiko back as Magnus Carlsen. There is one piece for Leiko that is still terrible. Which one is that one? A rook? Well, the A rook is problem child but it's not the main issue
It's a CA bishop. Now, we won't, don't really talk about this, and I guess most grandmasters don't like to get into the nitty gritty of chess theory, but most of the problems you ever get in a chess game comes from the C8 bishop. Either because you wasted too many times activating it, or you wasted no time and you just decided to play the French opening. In either case, that bishop is not good. Now, there is reasons why the Karakhan is kind of gaining in popularity to the French because you're sort of dealing with the issue of the bishop and plenty of openings, uh, good openings. And one of the best ones uh, sort of solved the problem. And that's why they're very playable and good systems. But a lot of cases, the positions you get, they're bad because of that bishop. So here, Laco's issue is again that bishop on c8. And there's a great point in chat saying his queen is blocking the bishop. So Black's job really should be to somehow untangle. Because yes, Black is solid enough. It's not like Laco is losing on the spot or anything, but has some issues sort of getting these pieces and just coordinating them. You can't really go bishop d7 because you run into bishop d3 and the queen is already kind of getting shaky. Now, if you have the extra material, it always sort of is a way of trying to release the tension or try to trade more. How could black sort of aim for that? And then, of course, we're going to see how Carlsen's masterpiece unravels. Can you play c6 now? Not really, because if you go c6, I take and the pawn is hanging, right? But the idea is correct. You want to somehow get c6 to work. How is the question. Yeah, rook d8. Rook d8, or it could be also queen to d7 and pawn to c6, trying to undermine it. Now, it's not what Leiko played, and um, there is something that I have to tell for anyone watching and saying, oh, obvious computer says rook d8, queen d7, or which have you. Both of them, I mean, seems very reasonable to me. Whenever you're facing a novelty, and like big preps by these top and super GMs, it's very difficult to keep your cool and just try to find a logical solution. Queen d7, c6, even though very logical, I mean, it's difficult to just choose out of the 10 other moves you could play here. Because why that? Why not something else? Now, the reason this would be kind of decent for Leiko, because after trades, potentially the bishop could get to the diagonal, and once that bishop actually at least gets developed, you should be more or less in an okay position, in a position which you can play. Now Leiko plays a6, and again it shows that Leiko is playing it solid. Rook e1, bringing your rooks on the open files, king h8, rook c1. And a lot of times people just focus on the fact that, oh, we sacrificed the pawn. But notice that Magnus's play is very unhurried. Is there any bad pieces left? Well, my rook on a1 and f1 wasn't really playing. Well, I'm just going to involve them in the game. Bishop d7. Okay, so we've improved 
on our rooks? Is there anything else that we could try to improve? Or any other square that could be of great use for white? E4, sort of, but it's a good question. What are you going to do once you get this square? Mm -hmm. And if your knight gets to g5, what's the goal afterwards? Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. So that's one way of thinking. But Magnus is going for a bit more strategic chess. So he's not going to go for a checkmate and an attack soon, or not yet. But by the way, you're correct. Like e4 is usually one of the strong squares, but the other one is d4. Now, you have to decide what you want to put there. Do you want to put a bishop, a queen, or a knight? Now, if you put the queen there, that's always double-edged because yes, your queen is going to be very strong, but also the queen can be in the way and easily attacked. If you go bishop to d4, does that accomplish much? No. It doesn't really do too much. Yes, it's, it puts some pressure on g7, but it really isn't what we're playing against. If you look at the moves we played, then it's something, by the way, you should always do. What is the direction white's pieces are aiming at? And that is a giveaway what you should be aiming to do in the position. So many of our pieces are facing the queen side here, right? Plenty of pieces lurking there. But as I said earlier, if you get your queen in the center, that's not going to help you. You don't really have a target on a7. I mean, Leiko is a class player. He made sure you never have a chance to actually win that pawn. Hello, hello. So backwards pawns, they're primary targets in the position. Rook c1, your target is the c7 pawn. So if you go queen d4, bishop d4, that really doesn't add anything to your line of play. So anytime you make a move, it should have and serve a purpose. So when I see Chad saying play a pawn to a4, that does not necessarily mean it's a bad move, but I just don't see the concept behind it. Now, sometimes our concepts are flawed, even if it's Leiko, sometimes. But it's better to have a concept than no concept at all, because at least you have some idea that you follow. So Magnus's plan is to go after this one, but you can because your knight is in the way. So what Magnus is going to do is this maneuver of getting the knight to d4. Now, you may find this slow, and it is very slow of a plan. There's a reason you can do this. What's the reason we can do this? What is the sole purpose and reason we can go for this short knight e2, knight d4 maneuver? The extra space. So we've got the extra space on d5. Well, it is somewhat semi-closed, that's correct. But also note that this knight is going to just go up and move to knight e2 and knight to d4. And with the fact that black is so cramped 
these pieces are so bad, that central control gives that uh, chance for Magnus to coordinate his pieces even better. Rook c8, queen b3, attacking the b-pawn, knight e2. And you got to give credit where credit is due. Magnus's play has been very smooth. Very, very smooth. Because all of his moves serve the purpose. You can't really say the same thing by Peter Leko's play. His move of king h8, even though semi-useful, isn't like probably the best move in the position. And the bishop isn't great. His pawn isn't doing too much. So Magnus is making some headway here. b5, knight e2. Queen h3, knight d4. Bishop g4. So Leko is trying to conjure up some counterplay in this position, as he should. Um, but Magnus is going to find a way to sort of shut him down. So let's try to figure out how us playing the white side could shut down Leko's play. And by the way, this is actually connected to preparation because it's not enough to have sort of internalized some ideas, but you have to understand the concepts. Like, you can't really play this pawn sacrifice line without really understanding where your pieces belong. And that's what Magnus is doing so well. All of the pieces he has in this position are functioning, high functioning. So, whenever you have the bishop there, your first thought shouldn't be, ah, oh, I'm going to give it up. Well, why wouldn't I give it up? Right? So, even though Chet is being very pessimistic that they're going to find the move, I'm less pessimistic about that. Yeah, bishop g2. It's not actually a hard move. So there is a level of mystifying um, these fantastic players, but you know, they also have studied Fisher's games and realized, hey, if I got the bishop there, I'm going to keep him. So bishop g2, and voila, we found Carlson's move. Queen h5, but you know, as I said before, and this time I agree, this next move is super hard. And I'm not even going to ask to be find this, but here the move, pawn to h4, is fantastic. So, yes, I actually think you can find bishop g2, h4, now that, so I'll be super honest here. I believe any grandmaster from 2500 to however much they would find these moves of bishop f3, probably knight d to knight d4, that's like 2550 and upper. But this next move by Carlsen is a Carlsen move because it really just makes sure no counterplay ever is going to be had by Leko. Leko might want to lurk about with bishop h3 and then maybe even think about some sacrifices at some moment, or knight f5. I mean, knight f5 isn't that scary, but mostly bishop h3. So Magnus goes h4, and what makes h4 such a great move, it completely restricts black's play. Bishop h3 obviously is not on the agenda anymore because I'm just going to capture it. And also, I put your queen and the bishop on ice. None of them are really participating anymore. And with three pieces completely sidelined, black isn't really uh, of any hope of actually succeeding here. So knight g8, rook c6, 
So there is a time to amp up the pressure and there's time to gobble some palms. So Pac-Man mode continues. Ship D7, Pac-Man mode. And now this Pac-Man mode actually works beautifully um, and the reason that this one is um, working and um, is good is because these pieces are sort of out of the way and really isn't doing anything. So knight takes b5, rook b8, a4, and um, this is the checking out part for Carlson. You got the advantage, it's probably decisive, but you still have to be on your toes. What do we have to know and do in positions where we have a huge advantage? Take away counterplay. I think Carlson already did a good job with that. Now there is another step that's very important to take. What's that? So you got the extra pawn. It's sort of like getting the loot. You got to defend the loot, right? So now g4, and Leiko is trying to play spoilers here. Bishop f3. So watch how Magnus basically puts an end to all these shenanigans. Bishop f3, nope, you aren't going to go for sacrifices. You're pinned. You take here, I take your queen. I take your queen there. Queen h6, queen c4. So now there are a couple of steps. One step, you put the pressure. Second step, you win the material. But then you always have to be vigilant because your opponent doesn't have to give up, roll over, and just say, hey, you're the better player. They can always play an aim for trickery. This move by Leiko is a tricky one. He's either setting up knight takes h4 or knight takes f4. In both cases, um, it's not a guarantee he's going to get full compensation, but he definitely is going to get some play and can muddy waters. So Magnus's move not only sidesteps this pin, but stops any of these tricks. Because if you take, I just capture you, and I'm up an extra piece. So these are those little trickies that makes this situation work for Magnus. Sidestepping ideas, look for your opponent's threats. Knight takes h4. Now Leiko, and credit for him, is still trying to do something. Bishop takes g4. And again, note, even though he is close to winning, that is Magnus, he's trying to minimize the risk. So if you take here, well, I already take here, queen takes h4, and it's already murky. He might be even in trouble. But Magnus is on his toes, takes here first, takes. Now, this looks scary, but Magnus obviously calculated this. Bishop f3 f5, just taking away all the entry squares, because if the queen and bishop would work together, it'd be game over. Queen h5, queen f4, bishop takes d5. So there's always like a give and take in chess. When you get the extra material, you get the extra piece, extra rook, it's sometimes more important to provide safety to your king than to have that extra pawn. You give up the extra pawn, but you stabilize. So Carlson's move of queen f4 is stabilizing. Takes, knight takes, bishop b7, rook b6. Again, could take the pawn, but that's not stable enough. Rook b6, just making sure Leiko doesn't get an open b5 to work with f6, bishop d4. Now there was another thing that I was trying to allude to. In this case, white actually has every single of his pieces over defended. The bishop is over defended by the queen. 
The rook you really can't get close to. This one's defended. These guys, like the c7, e1, that, those are the ones um, Carlson is looking out after. But as you have no real ways of attacking them, black is in big trouble. Queen f7, knight e6, so he's quick to actually put it onto a safe spot. King f2, safe spot, moving away from the danger zone. Rook c8, bishop c3, just cutting off the c file. Bishop d5, a5. Just starting to run the a pawn. Everything's under control. Also, queen a7 no longer really poses any threats because the rook is defended. Rook c4, knight d4. Again, closing off another way in for Leko. Bishop a8, queen d6. Now taking the pawn, stopping queen d5. Queen h5, queen f4, rook e6. And here Leko realizing there is no way through, he resigned. So one of the first prime examples, as I want to show another one, and that's going to be a game between Dominguez and Carlson, is that it's not enough to have a preparation, like a pro preparation that Carlson has. You still have to be understanding or have an idea what this uh, position is all about. So let's take a look at this game. This game between Dominguez and Magnus Carlsen. E4, C5, and Carlsen has played these Sicilians before, but guess what? Even though this is played much later, he goes for the dragon. Now, if I can quiz you people, and I will, who was the player who uncorked the dragon? in a match in New York. Yes? Kasparov indeed. Who was he playing? A legend. Actually, he has been showing some spectacular results quite recently at uh, some top event. Anand, yes, against Vichy, the big Vichy Anand, the tiger from Madras. Fantastic player, and um, talking about psychology. Now, Magnus is inflicting the same pain that Kasparov did. Dominguez is a very well-prepared player, but probably got, got caught unawares and did not expect the dragon to actually show up. But Magnus, just like Kasparov in his match against Anand, sort of relied on the surprise value, and of course they did their hard work. Bishop g7, bishop c4, bishop d7, rook b8, and that's kind of a different twist. So even if Dominguez kind of sensed that something is about to go down and think, hey, Carlsen is working with Kaspar Kasparov, well, how about I do a little bit of a twist? Now, in that game, so we can talk about that a little bit, rook c8 was played, bishop b3, knight e5, h4, h5, bishop g5, and queen a5, and this was the game between Kasparov and, I mean, Anand Kasparov, as Kasparov was playing black. Now, believe it or not, Carlsen also essayed this variation against Judith Polgar, and Judith played g4. However, g4 is somewhat unsound in this position. And I wonder if you guys know a bit of dragon lore. There are some typical sacrifices in this position. It's not that it necessarily works here, but it's sort of connected to what Magnus played in the position. And it really has to do of understanding the ups and downs of single moves. Judith's move of g4 has an upside of being aggressive and attacking and trying to push Magnus away, or this knight away. However, it has a drawback, a physical drawback that actually Magnus pounces on. 
and that is the F pawn. It's no longer well protected. So Magnus finds this very strong move of B5. You can't really take this because I go knight F3, and this whole structure for white collapses. And after G5, there is this typical Sicilian counter thrust B4. And after this, actually, black has a very, very good position. White's attack is sort of dying down, while Magnus' attack with A5, A4 is coming very quickly. So, even though in this game Carlson played rook B8, it's not like he didn't essay the more classical one that Kaspar Kasparov played, and that's the rook C8 line, which is, of course, the main line. In this one, rook b8 is played with the idea of pressing and opening up with b5. Bishop b3, knight a5. All right, so uh, one of the ways of sort of getting into a preparation mode is to try to make sense of the variation you are going to be playing. So let's try to make sense of this move of rook b8 and knight a5. Why would black play this way compared to that play of Kasparov? What could be the difference? I mean, it has to be a glaring difference, obviously, because these two moves just have completely different purposes. Why did black go rook b8? Well, you want to go b5. And um, of course, it does not necessarily make sense to have your rook there if you're not going to open up the file. So bishop h6 takes, takes b5. And the point is, for black, like let's say white goes pawn to h4, b5, h5 is to go knight c4 and just have your rook get an open file to work with and even go queen b6 at times. Let's say takes, takes. This is a typical move of going queen b6 and hitting the b2 pawn. So anytime you see these top players play their games, there's like a deep concept going on. And here the deep concept is to sort of play on the b-file instead of the c1. So knight a5 trades, b5, g4, takes, takes, b4, knight d5. Takes, takes, and we'll have to stop here for a moment. If you look at this position, what do you think white will do in the upcoming two moves? And this is super important because there's nothing other than your opponent that you have to worry about in a chess game. And if they find the best moves, woohoo! She might just destroy you. She may just destroy you. Now, the knight on f6 is a key piece in the dragon. If that's missing, you're almost borderline checkmated. So probably Lenny was not that unhappy with the situation. However, Magnus finds a way to consolidate. Yeah? Yes. So H for H5 is brutal. So if black is just ignoring this, you're just going to get mated. You are just going to be absolutely shattered on this side of the board because even if you take the piece, it doesn't matter. I have like five pieces attacking. Okay, only three. Uh, the h7 square, and you have no ways of stopping checkmate. And we don't have mate on the other side. So your Magnus finds rook b6, rook e1, probably giving up on this idea because of e5. And e5 is played anyways. So if black 
is going to face h4. Black can go queen e7, or maybe even pawn to f6. Don't know which one I prefer. But in both cases, one of the ideas to trap the queen with pawn to g5, the queen really doesn't have a way to get in the game. There's no real way to undermine the structure. And if you don't get mated in the dragon, usually black is doing okay or even better. The other move here would be queen e7, and you can also go g5. And there's no real way for white to break through. Black is solid. Knight f5, I just captured. So e5. But Lenny a takes, which seems like a correct decision, some pressure on those pawns. Rook e3, rook f7, over defending the bishop and the pawn. Like one of the critical points in the dragon is to know if your h pawn is defended or your king is safe enough. If you kind of get a feel to it and make sure you consolidate your king side is black, the dragon variation can be very playable. Knight d2, d5. All about restricting, not letting Lenny A come closer. Knight b3, queen c7. Just activating his pieces. King b1, rook b8. All right, so let's try to figure out this move, rook b8, which looks very peculiar. It's actually a very nice um, move with multiple plans involved. What could be the big upside of rook b8? Yeah, rook c8 and rook f8, but what makes this move so good, there's not just these rook moves that rook b8 is preparing, but a third option. And that is pawn to a5 and a4. So you're not only preparing to have direct threats on c2, but they also have to worry about a5, a4. So these multi-purpose moves are sort of the make or break of this position. Rook e1, rook c8, queen b6, d4. Now he's sort of switching it up. He's trying to play in the center as he's noticing that this rook is sort of overloaded. Has to defend the d3 square and the f3 one. Rook e5, if you go rook d3, there is bishop b5 and you're going to lose one of the exchanges, which is probably lost at this level. Rook e5, d3. Opening it up for the pieces takes rook f3 and with Dominguez's attack dying down this king on b1 actually is the one becoming a target I mean of course this is a brutal threat I mean not quite yet you have rook e1 but so that he could avoid queen g1 plays d4 bishop b5 again trying to push that king away in the corner rook e3 check Queen takes d4. So it's not enough to be well prepared in chess if you sort of never really practice tactics. And uh, Magnus just showcases this perfectly and brilliantly that, hey, it's good if you could make good moves, but you also have to be on the ball when the situation kind of demands it and when you have a tactics you need to find it especially in the dragon because it's all about taking the opportunity and the chance that you're given of course capturing here is not advised because rook c1 is checkmate and taking here is also ill-advised due to rook g uh, queen g1 and then knight c1 then rook c1 and of course following Mate on queen takes c1. Sticks, rook e6, check, queen g4. Again, cold blooded. Takes, well, it doesn't matter, I'm gonna take here. I could also take on f1. Um, and he takes on e6. And basically, black is up a pawn. However, this is the situation where technique is very much important. Can you guys tell me why technique is so important in this position for 
the black side, even though we are up the extra pawn. Yeah? I mean, it's very open and means you're still in the blue. Yeah, our king isn't particularly safe. So if we make a couple of mistakes, it is not at all improbable that we get made it by accident. So we want to avoid that. Queen takes, knight c5, c. Like Dominguez has his own little trickies. You don't pay attention, boom, you get made it. Queen e2, rook c1, bishop f5. And that's, that's what it shows that Magnus, even though he has the better of it, he does what he did in the previous game against Laco, consolidate. You got the extra pawn, you over defend your pieces. Queen f4, a5, again over defending everything. h5, queen e7. Coming back home, having a defender and pressing, trying to trade off a rook pair. Queen c4, bishop e6. <laughs> Another astounding defensive move. Of course, it's taboo. Can't take there because your rook is hanging. Queen g5. You still can't take this because I take and I take over on c1, you lose. h takes, h takes. And it's scary. I'll be honest, this is very scary of a position. But probably Magnus is sort of getting comfortable with the idea of getting to bishop f7, setting up this battery along the g8 and a2 diagonal, and then Dominguez is going to have his own problems, own king problems. A3, and I don't like A3 particularly because it's sort of weakening that diag even more. Takes, take, queen c3, takes, king takes, and this is what I was telling you people, the queen is coming in. Rook c2, A4. Notice Magnus isn't any of rush of trying to find a forced mate. King A1, A3. Queen e3, bishop f7, queen c3, g5. Queen e3, so Dominguez is just waiting around. But Magnus is very, very consistent in making sure everything's guarded. Rook e8, again, the rook was fleeting in the air, moves it to a better square. Queen c3, rook e2. Quite a move. You take, you got made it. Knight b3. Wait. Wait. Did Dominguez just blunder a piece? Did he just blunder? Exactly. So what makes these super GMs so tough to beat that they're so tricky, even at this last moment when you think that, ah, oh, this is just like a last moment just to despair, there's a trick. So this would have been a draw because even though you're up a queen, a bishop, and two pawns, it's a stalemate. What about king over? Well, even if you move king over, I can check you, and I keep checking you, I will not have to remove your queen from this square. So I will just keep checking you till the end of time. So of course Carlson doesn't fall for this. Takes and plays queen e5 check. King b1, king g7. And again, patience. Not rushing is just so important. Queen d2. Bishop takes b3, no more trickies, and here Dominguez resigned. So I really hope all of you enjoyed these games that I brought, this game between Carlsen and Leco, and Dominguez versus Carlsen. All of a, a bit of a Kaspar recipe, but with a Carlsen twist. So thank you so much for being here and tuning in to this lesson. Goodbye.